And welcome to another John Talks podcast. Today I have uh, Sam Beckman. Sam Beckman is a martial artist who has performed lots of uh, martial, art, martial arts styles. He's performed uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, a well renowned style in mixed martial arts. Uh, he's also performed kickboxing. Um, but I, I guess I'll let him explain like what he's done. Um, so. Sam, what attracted you to all these different types of martial arts? Sorry, what was that? Uh, what, what attracted you to all these different styles of martial arts? Uh, what attracted me to them? Yeah. Um, more just the diversity of them, because for someone, I believe that um, having um, a different knowledge and different concepts of martial arts will, I, I guess you could say, would make someone better at martial arts, I guess, and just also getting a better understanding of yourself and what you, um, not necessarily what you're better at, but um, how you can mix different forms in your own way of fighting instead of just having a specific style. Yeah, and, you know, what did you start out with? Because I know you're a four-time uh, kickboxing uh, champion. So th did you start off in kickboxing or...? I, I actually started off um, karate at a young age. And after a couple of years of that, I was starting... I guess I, guess I got a little bit bored of it because of the structure of it, because it was very... Not that it's a bad thing, um, but having a specific structure on certain things wasn't really my style. So after that, I went um, into boxing, which gave me a better, uh, which I even today still love doing. Mm. And, you know, what did you think of um, Conor McGregor losing at the latest UFC event? Um, obviously, you know, one of his main styles is. Uh, kickboxing, but he got um, he got beaten by a similar style fighter in Nate Diaz. Were you shocked when he lost? Yeah, I was. I was. I actually was. And to be honest, I wasn't very fond of Conor McGregor. I mean, not like he like hands down, he's an amazing fighter. There's no like just the way he fights, he's incredible. Um, I wasn't too fond of his personality until he lost, and the way he went about it, I, I, I like, I have so much respect for him, and I was very surprised that he lost because I, I honestly did think that he was a better fighter than Diaz, but I think what you also need to take into account, and which I think he did mention in one of his interviews, is that he is fighting someone heavier, um, and a lot of his fights have been with um, people who are lighter than him, all oh, well, in the same weight category. And what people don't understand is that it makes a major difference, especially with the power of people's punches and stuff like that. It makes so much more of a difference, even just a couple of kilos. Yeah, because he jumped from uh, one, 145 pounds to 170 pounds, which is, I think that's more than 10 kilograms. Um, so you could imagine, I think Connor mentioned that he felt very fatigued um, every time, you know, he kind of, you know, threw a kick or threw a punch. And a lot of that had to do with the heavier weight. And not just that, um, the fact that Nate Diaz could take his punch because, and, and Connor said um, he never, if he was versing 145 pounders, that they would normally just fall to the ground, whereas Nate Diaz, you know, could take it. Um, so I found that, I found that very interesting during the fight because, you know, obviously Connor had that 13 second knockout against, uh, Jose Aldo. Um, but yeah, I mean, his power, I mean, it, Nate just seemed to just keep coming at him. Um, do, do you think, yeah, yeah, yeah go on. Oh no, no I was just going to say, but, but like you said, you know, it, it it is a, you know, a big difference because Nate would be used to getting punches like that with a Connor wouldn't, and you know, and especially the weight is, I think 
you were saying it would tire him out a lot more, especially, you know, and I also reckon that, like, first round he was, I reckon he was trying to knock him out too because when watching the fight, he was doing those spinning, um, those capoeira kicks, and that takes a lot out of you. Like, that just takes out so many, so much of your energy and even the overhooks and stuff, like, just those major uh, hits take off so much energy out of you and I think that's what he was saying when he was getting gassed out and then when you landed the hits, you know. Yeah, and I, he made that exact comment. Um, it was a battle of energy in there and Nate was more efficient because he even made the comment that, yeah, when he was throwing those kicks, which looked absolutely amazing, he said it took more out of him than it did Nate because he wasn't, um, he was either landing it, um, he, he was inefficient, but he also landed some shots, but it wasn't really those, like, kind of kicks he was doing. Um, I mean, I love Conor McGregor's style because he's kind of, he's a come-at-you come at you fighter. He just goes at the opponent. Um, but but he's got extreme, you know, athleticism as well. Are, are you, like, are you impressed with that as a fighter yourself, the way he can, you know, move in the octagon? Oh, uh, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, the way he, and that's why I was saying that he was an amazing fighter because his movement is incredible. Like, like yeah, that, uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I, I reckon his movement is is flawless. That, that's my opinion, though. Like, I just re- I reckon he has an amazing, um, you know, and then that's a major thing being able to move because with MMA, the style is very flat footed. So, because of that wrestling background, you know, if someone tries to take you down, you can sprawl them. And that's why, like, you know, you see a lot of fighters flat-footed, which means, you know, they can't move as much. So when you see someone like Holly Holm or um, Conor McGregor, the way they move, it's like, wow, you know. Yeah, the footwork plays, you know, a major key, especially in boxing. Um, but what, what, do you think, what do you think Conor McGregor did wrong then? against Nate Diaz? What, what happened? Um, I just, re- I actually do, when I was watching the fight, I actually did reckon it would have been him gassing out. Because um, like I said, you know, first round, it, like I saw him throw about, I think it was like two or three of those couple weather kicks. And um, yeah, and because like I said, um, I've done a bit of couple weather um, training and those kicks, because they just, you know, it's a full range of motion. It takes a lot of energy out of you. And then while you're also in the heat of battle as well, um, you know, just constantly moving, it's just, you, it's pretty much just, you know, you're, a, you're a ticking time bomb. You're just waiting to, you know, waiting to let your body just gas out. And I reckon it was just him yeah, pretty much gassing out, which, you know, which leaves you really defenseless. Yeah, um, but, you know, that, that's funny because you would have thought that Nate Diaz would have probably gassed out because he only took the fight on, you know, 10 days' notice or whatever. Um, and yet he, he still looked really energised in, like, the second round. Um, but I think he and his brother, um, they do a lot of triathlon running. Um, but, but Connor had a full training camp, you know. Um, but I guess, like you said before, the weight, in the fact that he moved up in weight, and the fact, and the movements with that extra weight, I think played a played a part. Um, you were saying that he did a lot of uh, capoeira kicks. Like, what 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 is that style exactly? Sorry, like what is the the you said uh, the capoeira kicks? Like what, what? What? What does that style involve? I've, I've never heard of it. Oh yeah, they're just um. I can't really remember the specific names of them, but um. Yeah, it's just but just the way they are, um. Like just seeing, the, just the way the kicks are, they're a lot more powerful. But um, it's that whole trade-off thing with it being that kick being more powerful, it drains a lot of your energy. Uh-huh. Um, because you're just pretty much spinning your whole body into that kick. Yeah, but like, does it take a lot of practice to be able to f- perform, you know, 
one of those kicks because I was looking at McGregor's kicks at like inside oh, yeah. inside yeah, the yeah, octagon, yeah. and I was like, wow, because you don't really see a lot of martial artists perform the types of stuff Connor does. Yeah, um, well, there are actually um, a couple of um, MMA like uh, the, well, there's a very few amount of MMA fighters that do it, and it is because it's a very um, I mean, it is an efficient style in a certain way, but obviously it's depending on how you use that actual style. And because, like I said, with those kicks, you know, they take a long... It, it's The balance you have to have to perform those kicks takes a long time. And then by actually, you know, having the energy to throw those kicks. And you see Capoeira masters and stuff, their acrobatic ability and their stamina... You know, it's one of those styles that takes years and years to perfect. And that's why you don't really see it as much because styles such as like Muay Thai, Karate, they're a lot simpler and more efficient. Where there's a style like Capoeira, it's, it takes a long time to build up those skill sets. And unless you're starting doing that style at about five years old, then you would see more people incorporating it in their style of fighting. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And how about, um, because in mixed martial arts, like you said, it's not just about, you know, standing up, so like karate and, you know, boxing. It's also about the ground game involved. Um, Because when I was first watching MMA, as a neutral observer, I I had difficulty understanding what exactly was going on. Obviously, it's uh, Brazilian, most of the time it's Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu, and I, I did some research about it. Apparently, it's one of the few martial arts where the little guy can defeat the bigger, the bigger, the bigger guy. Um, what, why is that? Um, it's more the sense of because the history of jujitsu, um, well, Brazilian jujitsu, is that there was this Japanese guy who came down to Brazil, and I'm pretty sure it was with the. Gracie family, I'm not 100% sure on this, but pretty much what happened was one of the little brothers or, or, um, couldn't perform some of the actual techniques because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't big enough. So what he did was this little kid pretty much, um, he pretty much changed some of the way, the movement, and made it easy for him to perform those techniques. So instead of using strength and having to be the bigger person to throw because it involves a lot of throwing and then takedown. Or, yeah, the style is a bit more, uh, it's a bit similar to the judo, you know, throwing people and then um, ground work. But instead, what jiu-jitsu does is it uses the other person's body against them. So, And that's why it is for the little guy, because you're using your own body weight, um, no, sorry, their own body weight to perform your own techniques. Yeah, and it, and it involves, um, I've heard there's two types of forms of jiu-jitsu, it's uh, gi and no gi, is that, is that correct? Correct, yeah. So w- what's the difference between the two? Um, so with gi is when you're, um, if uh, you don't know what a gi is, it's pretty much what, if you know what um, a karate man looks like, that's what a gi is. And um, what gay training is it's pretty much using it's also using the gay to your advantage so you can do more chokes and well you have more chokes more techniques with the gay as you are able to manipulate your opponent's gay to do more chokes more uh, locks more breaks all those techniques and with no gay um, there's fewer techniques because you're not using um, you know, uh, their clothing to manipulate their body. You're just having to, you know, yeah, use their body pretty much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ha- have you performed in any, like, uh, jiu-jitsu competitions? No, no. My uh, ground skill wasn't adequate enough. Well, for me personally, I don't reckon, yeah, I wasn't, uh, I don't think I was ready to... Um, compete in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Yeah, it's um it's a hard it's a hard it's a hard style to perfect I think because 
Um, I think a lot of people can just look at MMA and not really take the ground game for what it's worth because there's so much involved um, in, you know, and, that, and you see Conor McGregor, that's a perfect example. He, you know, standing up, he's very good, but when he's taken to the ground, I think Nate Diaz is, he is a black belt in jiu-jitsu and I think he has the Gracie family with him as well and he just got choked. I mean, he, you know... He got, granted, he got punched, but, um, like, on the ground, like, Nate Diaz was far more superior in that regard. Um, and so, and so, and same with Holly Holm, you know, when uh, Misha Tate, you know, just got her to the ground, she had a clear advantage, but when it was on the feet, Holly Holm had a clear advantage, so, um, it's interesting, but so you think that uh, the stand-up game is more easier to learn than the ground game? Yeah, definitely, 100%, because, you know, it's very easy to learn how to throw a punch because we all, we all know what a punch looks like. We all know what, you know, we all know what a, I mean, in terms of, you know, like it's, it's very easy to throw a punch because we all know what it looks like. So when you look in any kind of, you know, even movies or TV shows, like, you know, we all know what a punch looks like. So when we throw a punch, it's a bit like, you know, for someone, just the average Joe, you know, it'll, it won't be as, it won't be an efficient punch, um, but it's easy to learn because they know sort of what it looks like. And the same goes with a kick. It's harder to throw a kick than a punch because no one knows how to throw a kick. It's not... I mean, people can throw a kick, but it's not going to be a proper kick because no one really sees what it looks like or how it's done. So when you properly throw a kick, it's, you know, one of those things. And with jiu-jitsu, no one knows what it... No one knows how to work the ground. Like, we just... We don't know... No one knows how to work the ground. And because no one sees how others work the ground and to the specifics and down to the nitty-gritty of it, you, you, no one knows how to do it. So that's another reason why it takes so long for people to learn is because when you're not, you know, looking at something for such, you know, well, from the start, and that's why people in Brazil, you know, the Gracie family, they, they play it like we play football. You know, we watch football, so we have an idea on how to kick a footy, and as we grow older, we keep kicking the footy, and it's like, you know, you've, you've become, you become good at it. You know, not a professional level, but you know how to kick a footy, you know how to kick it far. Yeah. It's the same with, you know, the people in Brazil. You know, instead of footy, it's uh, jiu-jitsu. You know, they know, how to, they know how to work the ground and it just becomes second nature to them. Mm -hmm. You know, same for people in Thailand. Every, you know, Muay Thai is a religion to them, just like footy is a religion to us, you know. They start up as kids and then they take it into their adulthood and, you know, and everyone there is a fighter. Yeah, yeah, especially, yeah, exactly, because there's so many great Brazilian um, fighters, you know, in mixed martial arts. You have Jose Aldo, uh, Rafael dos Anjos as well. Um, who else is there? Uh, there's oh, Anderson Silva, obviously. Um, yeah, Lyoto Machida as well, one of the classics. Lyoto Machida, yes. Vanderlei Silva, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but Anderson Silva, I guess, is a little bit of an exception to the traditional Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, his main strength is would probably be Muay Thai. Muay Thai, sorry. Yeah. Um, and some of the things he performed in the octagon were absolutely outstanding. You know, when when he would get them in the um, in the clinch, and he would just start rocking these knees into the opponent's head. I was like, oh wow, <laughs> he's so. He's so masterful, but he lost against Bisping. Did you hear about that? Did I hear about that? Yeah, he lost against Bisping, Michael. No, no, I actually didn't see it. No. Oh, okay. But um, did you know he had the long layoff? Or he got he got he got uh he got tested positive for performance enhancing drugs. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then oh, he... wait, no, I think I actually did see something about that. Yeah, and that's one of the topics I wanted to ask you about. Um, 
like performance enhancing drugs in um, in fighting. Um, even though I, I'd suggest not, have you ever encountered an opponent or or just some someone you know who you had an inkling that they might have been on performance enhancing drugs or? Is like it, it is. I, I believe it's a detrimental thing. Like it's, uh, it, it's a horrible thing to do because, like many other MMA fighters have said, I think GSP um, and uh, Ronda Rousey said it as well. I think I'm not 100 percent sure if she said it, but it's it's literally like bringing a weapon into the fight because you're it's it's you're enhancing your body beyond your limits and. Because you can do that. I mean, there'll be two guys, and if they're at this level, like the same level, someone's taking uh, enhanced drug, enhancing drugs, they're pretty much that one step above them. And it's literally like bringing a hammer into the fight. I mean, sure, you could probably knock out the guy, but, you know, he's he's got something, you know, uh, on his side. And also another thing about the drugs, I think there was that other fighter, and I can't remember who it was, which I think is a bit stupid, is that he was caught smoking weed and then he was suspended to fight in the US, UFC, which I think is stupid because, yes, it's a drug, but it's not a performance-enhancing drug. It's not something that will benefit you in the octagon. It's just, it's a, it's not going to affect you in any way. I mean, yeah, it'll, it, if anything, it may make you worse. I'm not saying it does, I'm just saying, but... For something that's not going to affect your performance in the octagon in a beneficial way, which will make you fight 10 times better, I think that was absolutely stupid on their behalf because, you know, you've pretty much suspended someone and then I'm pretty sure there are other people that who are actually on the drugs that have gotten away with it for so long, such as, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, he's a big dude. Uh, oh. He used to fight in K1, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I'm just trying to think. I can't really remember his name. Um, but could, could I just interrupt you there for a second? Um, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know the fighter you're talking about. It's um, Nick Diaz. Uh, so he got, he got suspended for smoking marijuana in the same yeah, match. It, yeah. In the same match, he was versing Anderson Silva who got tested for steroids. So it was kind of a little ironic. Um, but no, I mean, he got a five-year suspension for marijuana and Anderson Silva got a year's suspension for steroids. I mean, you know, talk about double standards. I mean, it's a bit ridiculous. Exactly. That yeah. Yeah, no, exactly, and then that's the thing, it's it's stupid because, you know, like, something like steroids, and look, what pe the misconception with steroids is that it's not, it's not something that makes you big, steroids is something that helps you with your recovery and allows you to work harder, and that's the thing, and because, you know, with Anderson Silva on steroids, it allows him to train harder and then recover quicker, so just say if he's training six days a week, He's able to train so much more harder in those weeks, oh, no, so on those days, sorry, because, you know, his recovery time, he's able to recover more, and then he's able to work harder. So it's, you know, it, like it's the same concept of bringing a weapon into the fight because you're allowing your, you know, you're allowing yourself to be a lot better than what you should be. Yeah, and, um, and I guess one of Anderson Silva's uh, defense points was that he, he, he said he wasn't taking, um, I think, I think it's important to say that, like, we're, like, because he, he, he says he's not guilty, we'll just say allegedly took performance enhancing drugs. Um, but he said it, he, 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 he made an excuse and said it, it was like a, like a medicine supplement he got from a friend. Um, which, you know, there was some root, like, a lot, a lot of people believed it, but, um, I mean, it's kind of hard when you have the legacy he has to admit to performance enhancing drugs, and that's why I say allegedly, because we don't, we don't know, um, 
But like what you said about steroids, because mixed martial arts, you have so many styles, as we've been talking about before, jiu-jitsu, uh, mu muay thai, um, you know, boxing, whatever. If you take steroids and have better recovery during your grueling training sessions, I mean that that's just that just gives you a clear advantage because it's not even the fight, just that you can recover better from training, and that that gives a significant advantage to um, the person who was on you know steroids. Um, has it ever been something that you've considered taking before? That I've considered taking? Yeah. Um, to be honest, because I've been wanting to take, um, you know, the fight game seriously and stuff. And look, I would never in my life take steroids. I would never, I would take any, I would never take any performance enhancing drugs. And I guess that's easy to say because I'm not, you know, in the actual industry, but I think it's also like the moral sense. Like I don't, I don't believe in drugs. I've never touched a drug in my life, so I wouldn't see why I need to, but I can under like I can definitely understand why because the thing is I know what it's like to train you know five days a week and stuff like that and I work full time so in between work and the training your body's just your body is so drained of energy that the next time you come in for training you can't train as hard because you know through all the days you've been training you can't you don't get enough rest and you know with fighters and stuff because they're most likely training six days a week maybe even more you know like. It would at least be six days a week, five, six days a week. And you can understand why they would because, you know, you're so drained and you're getting prepped for this fight and you want to train at your utmost ability, to, you know. You want to perform as best as you can. So I can understand why they would, um, but I, I, I'd never do it. It's just me, though. Yeah, I mean, it goes against the martial arts, you know, code, I guess, because... The whole point of martial arts is, um, you know, there's a lot of, as well as it's fighting, martial arts also teaches you about respect for your uh, fellow opponent. And if you're doing steroids or any other performance enhancing drugs, it goes against that code of, um, like you said, there's just that moral responsibility, not just to yourself, but to your opponent. You know, not having like you, you termed it as a sledgehammer, having a sledgehammer in the uh, in the ring or the octagon. You know, and yeah, it, may, it makes me question. But like you said, I mean, if these athletes at the elite level are working out five, six days a week, I could definitely see how they would be tempted to do it, um, especially when mu huge money is on the line. Um, and it's fair to say, I mean, a lot of UFC fighters have been caught on steroids. Um, you know, uh, like to, to name names, um, Anderson Silva, although he admits he doesn't, he didn't do anything. Um, there was Alistair Overeem, I remember now, it was him. Oh, Alistair Overeem, yeah, he's still, he's still in the UFC. Um, but he, he got suspended, didn't he? He, sorry? he got suspended? Yeah, yeah, he was another person on earth, though, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but the, but the point is that um, it, it seems to be, uh, like, quite a few people seem to be doing um, steroids in the, in the fight game. I mean, a lot of people have been caught, um, especially in MMA, but that, that's not... That, it's the same with any other sport, really. I mean, you can trace, I mean, you know, cheat, I mean, Lance Armstrong uh, in the Tour de France. Um, that's another example, but from a different sport. So it's always going to be there, but especially with martial arts, like you said, that moral responsibility to respect your opponent um, makes you just consider why they take drugs in the, in the first place. Um... But so yeah, so you've never. Ha but like when you, when you're when you're fighting, um, have you ever encountered someone who you thought, oh, this person must be on performance enhancing drugs, 
or at your level is it just not like a thing to like I don't think it really is I mean it's like it's pretty pointless because you're not there'd be no benefit out of it I mean for me I'm only an amateur fighter so it's a bit pointless because the whole point of it I reckon is just for the experience and look some people don't even do amateur like they'll have a parable from you know, from training to pro. And I'm really, really doing it just for the experience. So if I do go into pro level, at least I know and have an idea on what I'm getting into because it's, you know, I mean, yeah, it'd be pointless because, like I said, you're only fighting amateurs and, look, they're, they're only people that train, you know. They're probably, you know, four or five days a week, but they're not, you know, they've got other commitments to do and, you know, and they probably don't, yeah, it's just an amateur fight. It's not something to take... It's something you take seriously, but it's not something um, majorly. I take it more as a learning experience, just something to get used to the crowd, used to the ring, used to the way I fight in the ring, and that's about it. Yeah, so it'd be pretty pointless to take steroids because then I'm not actually getting the most benef- uh, benefits myself. Yeah, yeah, because in amateur fighting, it's not about winning. Um... So it's it's oh no no yeah so it's more about getting the best out of yourself. Sorry. It's more about at amateur level. It's more about getting the best out of yourself as opposed to winning. Yeah yeah exactly, and even like what the you know the Chinese say with with kung fu, it's um they say it's kung fu is an art of everything. So it's more just being a master of, you know, your specific trait. And that, that's exactly what I believe, you know, my, my uh, martial arts is to me is being the best that I can be with that sport or with, with that um, style of fighting that I can perfect my own style itself. Yeah, um, and, that's, and that's the principle, uh, like you said, George St. Pierre adopted, you know, um, not trying to become the best ever, but to say, I want to become the best that I can be. And I think that's an awesome philosophy to have because, it, you know, it gets the very best out of yourself. Um, you know, what, what, how about yourself, though? Like, what, what, what started out martial arts for you? Because a lot of it seems to be based on, um, like, with MMA fighters, just learn, wanting to learn how to defend themselves. So, for instance... George St. Pierre, he was bullied, so he, he learned how to do mixed martial arts and he became, you know, probably one of the most fearsome uh, people on the planet, so to speak. Um, then, you have, then you have, you know, Nate Diaz, Nick Diaz, who grew up in, you know, Stockton, which apparently is a hard, you know, place to grow up in. Mike Tyson. Um, so... Like, what, what start, why did you start off in mixed martial arts? Um, to be honest, uh, I've always been very fond of martial arts and because my background, my family, uh, they always did karate. And because I've always, I was always into you know, martial arts, so, you know, I did karate and it just didn't, it didn't feel right and I wasn't. Um, so then I went to boxing because boxing allowed me to grow at my, as it allowed me to grow at my rate, I guess. It allowed me to do things at my rate. So I could go as fast and slow as I want with certain things. I could control that. And I could control um, the way I fought and the style of hooks, the um, my jabs, my, my move, my, the way I moved my body, I could control that. And then... Um, because, you know, the MMA, I started seeing all the MMA scene and I started liking, you know, how it wasn't just stand-up, it was groundwork and, you know, something that is quite underrated. So I found a, a place where I used to do karate, I started doing MMA there just as a recreational thing and I started enjoying it and then I kept getting into it. So it was more, like, I've always been into martial arts ever since I was born. Like, it's just always been there. I was always into, you know, 
all that kind of stuff, but it was more finding what I really enjoyed. And look, I'll be honest, I prefer boxing out of all of it. I reckon boxing was just probably my favorite. Just the, you know, just the, yeah, I don't know, just the way boxing is, I love it for how it is. And I love MMA too. And I love how people incorporate the boxing game into it because it's very, you know, it's a very efficient sport. Yeah, um, especially, like, are there any, um, like, idols in the boxing scene that you really like? So, obviously, what a couple that springs to mind, um, Muhammad Ali, uh, and you talk, about, you talk about footwork before. I mean, Muhammad Ali's footwork was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to see someone move really well in the ring... Uh, watch Muhammad Ali in his prime. Uh, <laughs> pretty special. Um, yeah. But like, so who were some like boxing, um, some boxing athletes that you liked? Um. Well, growing up, I never really, like, I never really followed the whole uh, boxing thing or any real uh, fight sport that matter. I mean, I did see um, Muhammad Ali as a great fighter because, like I said, the way he moves and stuff, and that's that's the same with Floyd Mayweather. I mean, he moves, you know, and that's why he moves really well, and that's why he's great at boxing. That's why he's never lost a fight. But in terms of idols, um, Bruce Lee was probably my favourite um, just because, you know, he was, he was the one who took, you know, I kind of, I don't see myself as he, like him, but... Just more the way how he started off doing a certain style and then started learning all these different Eastern styles or even even just uh, Western styles, fighting styles. And he put them all together into his own little way of fighting, you know, which is now known as Jeet Kune Do. And that's, that's his, which translates to my way. So that's why I, I actually idolise him out of all of them because he was able to master different styles and put it and mix it in the way that his body type and that his he could perfect it himself and if you look at other people who do cheat kundo as itself they can never pull it off the way he does but there's a couple who look amazing the way they do it but it just it doesn't compare to the way he moves and the, the, just the way he does it yeah and that's a good point you bring up that like even though there's um, you know, different styles of fighting, um, you know, everyone has their different um, sort of way of going about it. So, you know, when you see uh, someone like a Bruce Lee fight or you see someone like a Conor McGregor even, they're different fighters because they put their own unique spin on it um, and they kind of innovate the sport as well. Um, because with Conor McGregor, he hired a movement coach, um, and you see a lot of the movements he does is not necessarily related to fighting when he's training. It's more like he's just rolling around, just in sand or whatever. Um, and movement seems to be like, yeah, a crucial part of the fight game. But you also have, uh, wrestling as well. Um, have you ever done any wrestling before? Have you any wrestling before? Yeah. No, no, I haven't. Uh, that seems to be one of the more dominant martial art forms because I look at, um, you know, say like a, a Brock... Uh, so do you know Brock Lesnar? Yeah, of course, definitely. Yeah, so Brock Lesnar came into the UFC with a huge... Um, so he did a WWE, obviously. Um, but that's not fighting. But then he, he already had a background of wrestling. Um, and he came into the UFC with barely, I think he only had one amateur fight or whatever. And a uh, mixed martial arts fight, that is. And he came into the UFC and, you know, he became the world heavyweight champion, which is absolutely, you know, phenomenal um, for someone who didn't have that much experience. But a lot of that had to do with his wrestling um, is, 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 is wrestling like 
one of the most dominant forms of mixed martial arts to have? Is wrestling. Like, is it one of the most, um, is it, like, if you had to pick styles, is it one of the best to have in your arsenal? In terms of mixed martial arts? Yeah. I, in my opinion, I reckon, um, I reckon Muay Thai, um, just in the sense of, um, just because it's probably one of the styles that has a lot more diversity in it and um, just the way the movement of it and the clinching and the techniques that it involves is very useful in um, uh, MMA and that's why you know they say um, generally they say Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu are the most efficient because it's not strength related uh, sports it's more I mean, yes, Muay Thai involves, you know, clinching and then pulling the person, but it's doing it, it's pulling them by their weakest points, you know, you're controlling their head, and it's all about control, and that's exactly what Jiu-Jitsu does, and Jiu-Jitsu allows the little guy to control the bigger guy, and so I reckon Muay Thai, in the sense, is a stand-up game, not saying that any other style is better or worse in that sense, I just think that Muay Thai has a bit more diversity in uh in that style. Yeah, um, especially yeah, especially in the stand-up game. I mean, you look at someone like Amanda and Silva who does it so well. Um, but I also know that uh, you, you're, you're like, uh, like, aren't you? Haven't you won it uh, like a, an award for uh, Muay Thai? Sorry, have I trained in it? No, have you won anything in that martial art? first fight was a um, was in Muay Thai and I, I did win that fight um, so that was the question yeah yeah but have you won any like awards in that martial arts style uh, yeah in kickboxing I did so I won four awards um, but that so three of them was kickboxing the first one was Muay Thai um, but that was my very first fight, so I was, com I was competing against someone um, at my level as well. And that's why, um, and because like Muay Thai is another diverse style, it's, you know, I wanted to step back a little bit and just train a bit more before I got into another Thai fight. Yeah, do you have any, do you have any uh, fights on uh, YouTube? Because if you, if you do, I'll, I'll put it in the um, YouTube bio. No, yeah. I don't really have anything on YouTube. Oh, uh, okay. But don't you have like a... Don't, haven't you got like a few videos on uh, social media? Uh, I've got a little bit on my phone, I guess. Uh, but I think I might have a video on Facebook. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. I was just wondering. Um, so... So yeah, and what, what what did you first of all and last of all like what did you think of um, Ronda Rousey losing to um, Holly Holm in Melbourne? Um, obviously, it was a shock upset. Um, did you were you were you expecting that that Holly Holm would defeat Ronda Rousey? I wasn't expecting it. I was hoping that Holly at home would be Ronda Rousey. I'm not a very big fan of Ronda Rousey just because of the, um, just because, like, she's, there's a lot of hype about her and stuff. I reckon she's just a bull out of the gate pretty much. And, uh, and Holly at home just played the matador really well. And the thing is, um, another thing about, you know, Rousey is that, I mean, yeah, it was a shock. But I'm glad it happened because now she's like, you know, it's like you know, the way she, Rousey treated other fighters before the hype. I mean, she treated them with disrespect, and that's not what martial arts is about. I mean, even Conor McGregor, you know, after his loss, you know, and I think he even said one of his interviews, he will treat that's his personality, and the way he treated his defeat was 
you know, he treated it like a true martial artist. You accept your defeat and you try and come back stronger. With Rousey, she went on Ellen, that, uh, the Ellen, uh, Ellen, sorry, and she was saying how she wanted to commit suicide and all this stuff. And look, you know, what? And I, I think she's done that to herself where she's hyped. She's made all this hype for herself, and when she lost, she just couldn't take it. And if you look at all the famous martial artists, you know, even Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, they've all had losses. Every Everyone has had their loss. And that's what I think is, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. But I'm glad, you know, she lost. But it yeah. was a shock. It was definitely a shock. Yeah. I, I was like, I, was, I went there and I was screaming. <laughs> I get, I get what you mean, um, especially the way Conor McGregor handled it, I mean, that was absolutely amazing, because he said, I'll be humble in victory, and I'll be humble in defeat, um, and he was exactly that, he respects, I mean, he's very um, cocky in prediction and in preparation, but after the fight, you've seen it with Jose Aldo, he said he was a phenomenal champion, um, and then when he lost, he said, yeah, Nate was the better man. Um, and I think, but where, whereas with Ronda Rousey, she, um, like in the immediate aftermath, she didn't really give credit to Holly um, until a lot after. So, yeah, that's definitely a martial arts principle which can be forgotten sometimes in the heat of battle. Um, but, yeah, so, Sam, I just wanted to say, um, so thank you for coming on the podcast. I've been wanting to get you on for a while. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries. Um, we'll uh, hopefully the audience doesn't mind um, the arrangement I've got here. So like the camera on with the laptop, just something different. Um, next time we should do a, like an in studio one, I think. Sorry. Uh, ne next one, if it's okay with you, we'll do a like we'll do one in studio. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Hopefully, I'll, yeah. Like, I'll be able to make it. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll find a time, whatever, um, like later on. Um, but, but yeah, so thanks thanks for coming on the, uh, the podcast. Oh, good to be here, thank you.